I'm not just a skeptic about big data. I have worked with people in medical research, scientists, epidemiologists, others, to try to expand access to data, to find personalized comparisons of treatment effectiveness, to advance medical research in many ways while still respecting privacy. But my concern is that we are about to enter a repressive data gathering environment. A data gathering environment that is so pervasive, so all encompassing, that it has a very high chance of unleashing a backlash. And it's because essentially we're seeing, primarily in the United States presently, but also moving globally, really new troubling modes of monitoring individuals. Some of these include, for example, there was a lawsuit two weeks ago by a woman who was told by her boss that he wanted her to put on her cell phone an app that would report to her employer 24 seven all of her location and movements. There's a hedge fund that now tries to manage what they call as bio-risk. How it does that is it has things like Fitbits on its traders. It keeps track of when they drink, how much they eat, and it correlates the eating and drinking to how well they do and how well their trades perform the next day. Okay? Uh, there's a company out there called Profusion that has recently pioneered a collation of biometric and other information, such as web browsing habits about employees, about even the CEO. They put it all together, and they're trying to draw correlations and figure out what makes people effective, what makes them not effective. There are US wellness programs that include Fitbits, mood tracking, biometric tracking, et cetera, where essentially firms, because in the US firms have so much uh, at stake in terms of their employees' health, they often are insuring or self-insuring for their employees and providing them with health care, they're trying to essentially find the healthiest workers or make them as cheap as possible from a healthcare perspective. We also have this uh, package delivering company called UPS, it's like a DHL or FedEx here, which has constant camera monitoring within the driver's area where drivers are trying to make deliveries. And what's amazing about this is that drivers now are actually running across the street against the red light, endangering their lives because they know that if they don't complete the delivery within a certain specified number of seconds, the software may start monitoring them and reporting to them to higher ups. And actually, this, what's kind of odd is that this even affects some customers badly because they've perfected the monitoring of the package, the effort to deliver the package. They haven't perfected the monitoring of actually delivering it to the person who's supposed to be delivered to. So, so a lot of the drivers, in order to up their speed time, will just put a note on the door, tried to get you, knocked on the door, uh, didn't really find anyone at home. But in fact, there was someone at home. They never knocked because they didn't, couldn't take the time to actually deliver the package. <laughs> so you've got these examples that are almost like out of the Marx Brothers of sort of a, or Charlie Chaplin sort of speeding up in the factory. People going faster and faster, trying to do more and more to keep up with the machine. And my argument today is that essentially there are three sort of categories of problems in this area of big data that can map to data collection, analysis, and use. Okay. And I'm going to start with collection and talk about some of the ways in which that leads to inaccurate data, what the usual responses are, and what my response would be in that area. So to come to the area of collection of data, what's really interesting here is that the technologies of surveillance and the database technologies, they sort of go forward and they get adopted because often there are myths spun about the efficacy of the big data-driven technologies. But remember that the Big data technology need only be adopted, particularly if it's low cost, if it's slightly more accurate than the older methods of assessment, it doesn't need to be absolutely accurate. So what we're finding in the US is there's lots of people who say have black marks on their record, they're blackballed on totally uh, fallacious grounds. For example, there was a woman who was essentially in a database listed as a meth dealer. She'd never been convicted, but this secret database was informing many decisions made about her. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, well, the only solution to that is just she should sue under defamation law. Well, the problem here is multi-manifold. First of all, many people don't even know that these databases exist. So how can you sue someone for a secret database? Secondly, let's say that you do find out and there is an error. The problem is that in the infrastructure of data proliferation and data dissemination now, there's no way in which correcting it at the source leads to correction at, to all the places where it's been shared. So in her case, she did correct it at the source data broker. She later found out that 70 others had received the information and there was no way for the source to get to the others that had shared it with the information that it was false. She was litigating for years, okay, trying to correct this. Now, I believe that we need a totally new approach and we need to recognize that this new big data infrastructure is defective by design. 
we have to ensure that when there's the spread of data among literally thousands of brokers, that there is a connection to the provenance, the origin of that data, and that when there's an error, it can easily be corrected over time. This is going to be a technical challenge. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I'm not saying that this is easy. But I think that especially when these new big data-driven systems have become so popular and so powerful, it's the least we can do for ordinary individuals to make their life a bit easier and to lead them to buy into larger data collection systems. Now, next I'm going to talk about data analysis. And the analysis problem is just as important as the data collection problem. We now have technology in American colleges that will essentially score students when they come into a classroom red, yellow, or green. Red means watch out for the student. They are on the brink of risk of failure. They're at the risk of dropping out, et cetera. Yellow means, hmm, OK, student. Green means they've done pretty well over time. These red, yellow, and green designations are things that the students never know about. They don't know. Only the professors know as they come in, these sort of like pre-classifications. And also, students don't know exactly how these things are being done. I mean, one college actually ties into it information about their visits to the dining hall. So you might wonder, you know, justifiably, wow, if I, if I skip the dining hall too many times this week, will they put out an alarm for me or something? Again, it's this movement toward an administered society that is often really troubling to me. We also see this in the uh, spread of credit scoring. People, for example, can be penalized on their credit score simply for trying to find out why they were earlier penalized on their credit score. <laughs> you know, there are all these sort of ways in which, and fraud scores, which are used often as well. There are these fraud scores that are out there that essentially can mark someone and really knock them out of employment just on the basis of having this fraud score. And there's a whole report called The Scoring of America that discusses exactly what's going on here. And some people say to me, well, the EU and other more enlightened jurisdictions, we have better privacy laws. This won't happen here. However, my problem, though, there is that I don't think there's adequate enforcement resources. It really is a black box problem. It's hard to find out exactly how the scoring is used. And finally, you're going to see increasing use of free expression logics for data brokers to say, I have a right under free expression to say that person will get sick and die in three months. Don't hire them. Very troubling problem, right? And this is going to lead to huge conflicts between our commitment to principles of freedom of expression and, say, fiduciary principles that would lead us to highly question those types of uses of data and those types of stigmatic classifications. And also one of the classic uh, arguments about how to deal with this opaque scoring is that people say, oh, well, competition will solve it. You know, eventually there will be modes of, of scoring that will be uh, compete in the marketplace to be more accurate or more responsive to consumer concerns. But this, again, is a red herring because the competition here is to serve those who are evaluating consumers. It's not to serve consumers. So we can't just buy into the competition rhetoric. My view is that we need an opportunity to examine the data according to due process principles. When we're being judged by creditors and others, I believe that these scores are taking on something that is properly considered a quasi-judicial role. And I would say that now in our 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, we need a new set of principles that's going to bring us into this modern age of big data regulation. And I think that without it, we're really left in something like a big data star chamber where incredibly important decisions about whether we are likely to be frauds, whether we are likely to pay back our bills, whether we're likely to be good employees, are made simply by algorithms that are unaccountable and totally opaque. My third and final category here is going to be about uses of data. We've talked about collection, we've talked about analysis, now let's talk about the uses of these types of opaque scoring and algorithmic prediction systems. It was revealed uh, in the United States that a a uh, credit card company had made a very dramatic finding in analyzing the ways in which its consumers were using the cards. They found out that when someone used the credit card to pay for marriage counseling, they were more likely than the broader range of consumers to default on their debts or to be late in payments. For the, from the credit card company's perspective, this was quite a scientific discovery. They could now raise the interest rate and lower the credit line of those who use their credit cards to pay for marriage counseling. Okay? Now, I think this is very problematic, right? I think it's very troubling that when people go and try to actually help their marriage, they are being actually effectively penalized in this situation. Now, the current uh, regulatory response to that is to say, oh, we just need more disclosure. So that if people object to having a credit card issuer that judges them on sensitive information, like counseling status, they can choose another credit card issuer. 
I think that's problematic for a number of reasons, one being that it's incredibly hard to keep track of these things. I can barely keep track of the rates on the credit card. Am I really supposed to read about the 57 uh, predictive analytics categories they use to decide whether they're going to give me more credit or less? Moreover, I think that it's okay to talk about disclosure in the context of data collection and analysis, because that is in the realm of the mind. That's still in the realm of the abstract, of analysis and science. But once data starts being used to make real life decisions about people, we need a stronger response. And that's where I would say that in these very critical areas, like employment, credit, education, uh, landlord de decisions, in many of these types of areas, we need to just get rid of this sensitive data from the scoring mechanisms and the algorithmic predictive analytics that are being used in these areas. I think we need to have the firms involved be able to certify that sensitive information like counseling status, like health status, uh, perhaps even like political views, other things like that, that those are not entering into algorithms about how good an employee or how good a credit risk you are. I'll just close with a final analogy. Okay, we've gone through the realms of collection analysis and use. Here's a final analogy that I, I try to draw on to really give people a sense of the gravity of the problem. When the Human Genome Project really got going when we started really, or back before that, when we started really analyzing genetics and how we could affect the genetic code to influence um, uh, even uh, embryos and to influence biology, biology in general, we had an immediate response, which was to say, this is such important, epically important knowledge that we need to ensure that we fully considered the ethical, legal, and scientific implications of it. I believe that the Human Genome Project is mirrored by all of this big data surveillance, which I would call a human knowledge project. And I think we need to treat that just as seriously as we treat the Genome Project. The genetics projects and, the, and understanding genetics and now the CRISPR technology, those are ways of trying to understand what makes us tick on a biological level. The big data surveillance apparatus is essentially an effort to find out what makes us tick on a social level, to achieve that level of intimate understanding of human society. And I believe that there are really some strong parallels here. So for example, there's often a really fine line between productive good uses of the technology and oppressive ones. With genetics, you know, I'm sure almost all of us would applaud efforts to get rid of genetic abnormalities and genetic disease, but we also recognize that certain forms of genetic engineering raise real policy questions. I think similarly with the example of big data, we might all applaud, say, some basic analytics of how well drivers do, but when drivers are monitored every second, second by second with a camera that's in their face, that starts becoming too invasive. It starts becoming oppressive. I also believe that the, pro that the parallel with gen genetics is powerful because it's unknown exactly where it will take us. Okay? We don't know exactly which direction this all-purpose technology is going. Better to front load the ethical and legal analysis than perpetually be trying to play catch up. I'd finally say that it could lead to arms races. Okay? We could see in the genetic context an arms race of potentially people trying to be better and better uh, or to try to, uh, to, to where it's impossible to sort of resist genetic engineering. And similarly, it's sometimes impossible to resist the modulating pressures of conforming one's behavior to the expectations of a big data apparatus. So with my proposals, what I'm trying to say is that if we as a society are committed to, say, having laws that would prevent us from using genetic information to discriminate against certain employees, not hire them, not promote them, we should similarly be open to and receptive to blocking out certain forms of information when making critical decisions about individuals. And I think if we're not, and if we don't take a much more conscientious stand on the extent of the collection of this data, openness about how it's anal analyzed, and restrictions on how the most sensitive data is used, we are really headed toward a very troubling black box society where essentially algorithms, rather than human judgment, are making the most critical decisions about our lives. There's something about this problem that is doubly difficult, because on the one hand you present the effects of the problem, but the communication of the problem is also challenging. How have you found that challenge, and, and how do you think we might make that communication you know, as powerful as we possibly can, so that more people realize this is a real threat to their lives? I always love this quote from Gillian Tett, uh, where she was writing about mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations, and she said, if you want to hide something in plain sight, the best way to do that is to make it as boring as possible. <laughs> and I think that there is a certain jargon and a way of speaking about this material that intimidates, say, a lot of public intellectuals, a lot of concerned public interest attorneys from even getting involved in it. Right. What I would say is that what's critical is to talk about where the bodies are buried. Where are there individuals and people that have been victimized by these types of processes 
and get them to tell their stories. Right. The CEO of AOL, uh, when the company was having a difficult time, this uh, internet company, said, well, one of the reasons we had such a difficult time is because two of our employees had children who were really expensive because they had complicated births, and this really dragged the company down. Well, if you're working in a company that's, say, less than 500 people, and someone in the and an employee there has been pretty open about, say, their child being in the hospital for six months, pretty easy to re-identify who that person is, right? And similarly, you're seeing some things happen, say, with the Google antitrust case. I didn't do much on sort of search and media, but I think that some of the companies that had been downranked by Google suddenly, and they feel without justification, they're starting to tell their story. The EU competition authorities are listening to these stories. And they're starting to dig into the black box. Because before these entities came forward and told their story right. from the perspective of the one affected, they'd only thought about it from the perspective of the users of the big data, not those affected by it. What you were speaking about is a kind of a new phenomenon of the like, you know, you mentioned genetics as an exa a parallel. You're speaking about a huge infrastructural kind of thing. Um, but I don't think people feel that yet. And I guess I'm just trying to get at what would it take to get to that tipping point where people don't think data and switch off, but think data and feel, okay, that's me politically engaged. Data matters to me. It's real to me. One analogy I try to use is the sense that you're constantly being scored for different purposes. And I think that that's one that sort of raises people's attention and says, I do not want to live in a world where every single moment is sort of an, an opportunity to either get ahead or fall behind. I also think that the analogy of the environmental movement is helpful. So say before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and environmental uh, movements around the world, people would look at a polluted pond and they'd say, well, I guess that's one bad landowner and uh, let's sue them in tort and sue them under a nuisance cause of action or something. Right. Ultimately, though, people had to say, wait a second, this is not just a problem of, say, a few bad apples sometimes spilling some oil or pollutants into a stream. This is a systematic problem, and this is affecting people on a far more systematic level, and we have to start saying, rather than trying to clean up after the problem has happened, we have to have a regulatory apparatus that licenses, say, only a certain level of pollution. And I think this data pollution analogy is very strong because there are a lot, first of all, there's a lot of good actors out there. There's a lot of people that are using this data for perfectly legitimate purposes, but there is not the level of self-regulation attempted, or I think even possible, that could drive out the bad actors, the people that are selling lists of women who've been raped, people selling lists of AIDS victims, people selling lists of the bipolar and the depressed. These folks are out there, they're not being regulated, and we have to see they're not just individual bad actors, but they are part of an overall structure that needs a larger, I think, regulatory response. Sure. There's this kind of ambient expertise around data. There's a sense that if it's data, it's somehow objective. It, ha it takes on this pseudo-objective form that leaves people feeling, how can I possibly argue against that? And, and that, that's, that, that's presumably why you need transparent fora to actually have those arguments. That's right. I mean, I think one of the biggest problems is that people do get intimidated by, say, the quantitative analysis, etc. But a lot of times, the most important critique is to get behind the algorithms and the analytics and to say, how good is the data source? Right. So for example, there was recently a study published uh, on Facebook users. And there's this controversy over what's called the filter bubble, this idea that people are just Facebook and other forms of social media are leading individuals to self-segregate into groups that are like them, so they're not hearing the other side of political stories. Well, Facebook actually had researchers look into this, and they published a major story, I think it was in Science or Nature, it was a major study, that said, nope, it's not really Facebook's problem, it's the problem of people choosing themselves to get into their filter bubbles. Well, the most problematic aspect of the study from my perspective was, the sample they chose was people who self-identified as Republican or Democrat in the US on the first page of their Facebook profile. And that's pretty rare, right? I mean, I don't know, I, that's only about 4% of users. So to me, you don't really even have to be a very sophisticated data analyst to sort of come out from the outset and have some skepticism right, about right. that sort of result because the sample was so skewed.